Okay, and at 7.03 p.m., we're going to call the meeting to order of the Bridgewater Rainham Regional School Committee here at our Bridgewater Rainham Regional High School. Thank you all for coming. We are actually returning from executive session with nothing to report at this time. Again, thank you for joining us. I'd like to just introduce our committee members here at my far right down there is Mrs. Julie Sklip Harris, Mr. Tony Gelfie, Mrs. Lillian Holbrook, our vice chair, Mr. Michael Dolan, and to my far left, Mr. Jason Hammond, Mr. Kevin Marrera, Dr. Sue Prewindowski, and our superintendent, Mr. Swenson. Again, thank you for joining us, and please join us now for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our next agenda item is approval of minutes. We have minutes of the January 24th, 2017 meeting. Members have been provided with copies. Do we have a motion to approve as presented? Motion by Mr. Marrera, second by Mrs. Holbrook. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Um, next we have correspondence and a recognition, Mr. Swenson. Thank you, Madam Chair. This evening, I would like to take some time to highlight some of um, our students throughout the district. First, I'd like to start with our music students. Many of our Bridgewater Raynham Regional School District uh, student musicians recently auditioned for SENSBA, which stands for the Southeastern Massachusetts School Band Masters Association. Those who qualify to perform will um, be able to uh, participate in an, two upcoming uh, musical festivals with other top-notch mu uh, student musicians from around the area. The SINSBA uh, auditions results came in and we're very proud to announce that many of our students did extremely well. In the grades 9 through 12 senior festival, 10 of our instrumental and 6 of our vocalists were accepted. In the grades 7 through 9 junior festival, 11 of our instrumentals and six of our vocalists were accepted. The Bridgewater Random Regional School District will be sending students from every eligible school, including Bridgewater Middle School, Rainham Middle School, and the Bridgewater Random Regional High School. The district is also proud that they'll be represented in every ensemble, junior band, tremble chorus, mixed chorus, orchestra, senior band, chorus, orchestra, and jazz band. Bridgewater Rainham Regional School District has four sitting in the first chair in this section, which means that they scored the highest of all students who auditioned for that specific instrument. This is an outstanding accomplishment for one student, never mind uh, four. And the students are Owen Cavallo, eighth grade, junior district mallets, Liam Barrys, grade seven, junior district tuba, Shauna Aju, grade 11, Senior District Alto, um, Alto Sax, and Logan Heath, grade 11, Senior District Trombone. Logan Heath, I'd like to mention, also has recently been highlighted in the Boston Globe for winning a major piano competition and playing at Carnegie Hall. And how awesome is that? Finally, and unrelated to uh, the Sensba Festival, uh, however, still incredibly notable, Hannah White, a grade 12 soprano, was recently accepted into the All-State Chorus. She is one of 50 sopranos in the entire state to be accepted. And after a weekend rehearsal this weekend, March 1st to the 3rd, she'll be performing at Symphony Hall in Boston. So congrats to all of our incredibly mm -hmm. talented student musicians. You have brought great pride and honor to our district for all your hard work and dedication. And a special thank you goes out to all of our music educators throughout the district and their parents for all the efforts in supporting these outstanding student musicians. <laughs> um, as far as BR Athletics is concerned, I would like to take this time to congratulate freshman Megan Kramer who is Bridgewater Raynham Regional High School's first Massachusetts State Champion in swimming. She placed first in the 100 yard breaststroke and second in the 200 yard individual medley. 
Megan and her coaches have brought great pride and honor to her family in the district. So congratulations to Megan as well. <laughs> and our BR gymnastics team will be competing for hopefully a back-to-back -back state championship this coming Saturday at Shrewsbury High School at 2 p.m. They are one of eight teams that will be competing and we wish them all the best in an attempt to repeat as state champions. At this time, I would like to see if Mr. Delisle from Jotwells, he's right here, if he could please come to the podium. This evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee, we would like to acknowledge and recognize one of our wonderful food service employees in the district, this is Patricia Paula. She recently acted quickly and helped a student who was in distress in the cafeteria at the George Mitchell Elementary School. And we would like to tonight recognize her for her uh, due diligence in doing her duties. And I'd like to first introduce Mr. Delisle, who's the head of food services at Chartwells, to. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for having me here tonight, uh, everybody. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, about a, two weeks ago, I got a, an email from Mr. Powers in, in the late afternoon. It was a forwarded message. It wasn't one of those uh, email everybody type of messages. And first thing is I thought, oh, what happened? Or what am I, what am I about to read? And uh, if I could, just real quick, uh, one of the counselors who works in our building, which is the Mitchell Elementary School, uh, has lunch down in the cafeteria often. And she wrote this to Mr. Powers and a few others and I was being forwarded this. It says, uh, hello, I'm not sure if you're aware of something that I feel compelled to share because of how monumental it is. On Wednesday, I was down in the Mitchell cafeteria getting lunch. I was lined to pay, and a staff person was asking for help with a student. Pat Paula was in the process of ringing up my items, and she dropped everything to help out. A young student was choking, not breathing, and her face was red. She was in distress, and Pat got behind her and performed the Heimlich maneuver on her causing her to spit out what she was choking on. The staff person thanked Pat for helping, and Pat returned to the register and continued to ring up my items. <laughs> I told her that she appeared to have just saved that little girl, and I was so impressed by her quickness to act and her skills in the heat of the moment. Pat remained calm and in control and truly saved this little girl. I am just so impressed by her actions and abilities. I've always enjoyed Pat's ability to brighten our day when she drops off lunch to the kids in the, caf in the classroom and tells a joke or brings a special item for someone. But on Wednesday, my respect for her as a person and a colleague has surpassed what I ever expected. I thought you should know. Thanks. So that made me super proud. Um, you know, I've known all of these uh, ladies in the cafeteria for 12 years that I've been here, and Pat's been here longer than that. Uh, she truly is somebody that I respect and I come to work with every day, and, and, and she does brighten your day every single day. Somehow, some way, she will brighten your day. And, and it must have just been, you know, something that she had to do. Oh, I gotta go save this little girl for a minute. I'll be right back. <laughs> but, you know, it, 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 it lends to what we do as a group, too. Uh, you know, last year we had CPR training as a group, and Pat was part of that group that we offered the CPR training to at uh, the Conan Center last spring. So whenever people say, you know, training's you know, not worth it or it'll never come up or no big deal, whatever, you know, there's a little girl that's happy that she took the training and she, she made it, you know, her, her, her need to go over and help her out. So in addition, thank you, Pat, for that. In addition, I got on my horse after I found out about this a few days after it happened because she's very modest. And uh, so I told my boss, and she said, oh, you know, recognition program, Chartwells has a recognition <coughs> program. And today I found out that Pat is February's National Class wow. Act winner. So Class Act is just a recognition program that Chartwells has nationwide, and we're split up into different groups. And anyway, there's a national winner. And it says, for nearly 15 years, Patricia Paula, a food service worker at the BR School District in Massachusetts, has been a valuable team member. She prepares hundreds of meals each day, serves as a lead cashier, manages classroom celebration orders, delivers lunches to the day student's classroom, and even recently dressed up as the Sydney mascot for school activities. The dedication and enthusiasm Pat brings to work every day is enough to show she's a true class act. 
but a recent his heroic act makes her this month's national winner. A few weeks ago, Pat helped a young student in the cafeteria who was choking. She quickly performed the Heimlich maneuver to dislodge carrot sticks stuck in a child's throat. Pat's modesty, modesty is admirable. She didn't want the activities to be a big deal, but her actions only reinforce the difference we can make every day. Her class act will never be forgotten, and her efforts are recognized and appreciated by all of us. So, Pat, thank you. Maybe come up and get a handshake from the person. Yeah, if you stand right there, I should have read this first, Mr. Jalal, because you kind of outscooped us, because <laughs> this is not national, but it is Bridgewater Rainham, and it's a, certificate, <laughs> it's a certificate of commendation. This certificate is awarded to Patricia Paula with a sincere thanks for your valuable service to the children of the George H. Mitchell Elementary School. You are to be commended for your taking quick action in performing the Heimlich Maneuver and ensuring the safety of one of our students, and it's signed by our superintendent and myself on behalf of the school committee. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Delio. No recognition. That's all. Oh, I know you want to take that out of order, but. Okay, and also I think we are going to move up on the agenda from new business, the Sydney Craven Scholarship Fund. Mrs. Heather Craven wants to address us about that. So if you want to come to the podium, Mrs. Craven. Um, this is my first time coming to a school committee meeting, so I want to thank um, Bridgewater Raynham um, for letting me come and speak today. My name is Heather Craven, and I am the president of Sydney Craven Memorial Fund in East Bridgewater. Um, for those of you who might have seen um, the tutu run every year in East Bridgewater, we're on the third annual tutu run, and um, I really thought it was important for me to reach out to the Bridgewater community, West Bridgewater community, and East Bridgewater community, um, as we're in year three of it, because I wanted to inform everybody a little bit about what our fund is, what my mission is, and um, what we have to offer for Sydney Curry Memorial Fund. Um, I do apologize because I talk really fast, because getting up here is Sydney's mom. Um, who is no longer with us, it takes a lot of courage. So please bear with me for a minute. You're doing fine. Um, so March 19th, 2015, um, Sydney um, was, was a twin to Logan Craven. Um, and we put both of the twins to bed um, that night. And um, the dog, we were Boston Terrier, Bronco, um, told us, you know, he's scratching at the door. My husband said, you know, he must have left the dog bones in there. And I said, I don't think so. Um, went to the door. Um, my husband went in and told me, told, turned on the lights. And unfortunately, um, your worst nightmare as a parent was given. Sydney wasn't, um, wasn't alive anymore. Um, we called 911. We did everything we could um, in a blink of an eye. As a mother um, to twins, I am an educator as well. I'm an elementary guidance counselor. Um, that is probably the worst thing that can happen to any mother. So our life turned around in an instance, in a snap, actually. And um, being an advocate, being a counselor, being a mother still, because um, I had to take care of Logan and I had to carry on, I said to a couple of my friends and family members, well, I got to do something. What can I possibly do um, to keep my daughter, Sydney Craven's legacy alive. Anybody who, have, who has met Sydney or who has known about Sydney from sydneycraven.com um, has seen pictures or heard me get up and speak about her at events or in the newspaper, the Enterprise. I'm always talking about how spunky she was and how she just filled the world um, with so much laughter and sparkle. And she's a little, she's only Literally, she was 90 shy of her second birthday. So for someone, a little child, to be able to make an impact on this world, um, I feel like she did. 
and it's my job as her mother to carry on a legacy um, that I have set forth um, with Sidney Craven uh, Memorial Fund. <coughs> so that being said, I want to tell you a little bit about what her mission is. What is Sydney Craven Memorial Fund? What can we offer as scholarships to these young students in the Bridgewater, West Bridgewater, and East Bridgewater community? Um, as far as Bridgewater, um, it, Sydney Craven Memorial Fund is a scholarship. Um, scholarships are set up for children newborn to age 12. And it, we want to give scholarships to children to help enhance their inner sparkle, help with their self-esteem, help with their some emotional um, or social emotional well-being. So for example, if we have a, you have a child who struggles with friendships. We just sent a child to a summer camp last year. Um, the child has actually Asperger's and the parents applied and their we actually granted their child to go to camp. And in that, we, by sending that child to camp, it kind of helps Sydney's mission sparkle on, which is like a term that we use. Um, of the hashtag that I use for it, like yeah. hashtag sparkle on, because I want to see Sydney sparkle shine. And, and I sit here today because I feel that there's so many families um, that feel that they don't, um, there's no criteria, like they're, they're maybe ashamed, or like I don't, I, don't, I don't think I fit that financially. It's really not a financial piece. It's more like what do you want to see for your child? Do you want to see your child sparkle? Do you want to see your child shine? There's got to be something extra creativity or camps. Um, music lessons, dance lessons, uh, gymnastics, uh, karate, um, anything that you can think of that you think that your child has the opportunity to kind of enhance their self-esteem and make themselves feel better, we want to be able to help out. So uh, I'm going to hand out a couple of, I brought a couple of pamphlets and I brought a couple of um, news our newsletters. We just started a new newsletter this year to let um, the community know what we've, um, what we've done. I also wanted to talk a little bit about, real quick, about the third annual Tutu Run. Um, and that is just a, um, that is our, our big fundraiser for her. It's on June 16th, um, 2018. Um, it is the day before Father's Day. Um, it is a race. You come in your tutu, you come in your sparkle, you can walk, you can run. I always say, I don't care how you get across the finish line. It's all about the joy. It's about a family experience. Um, we also have Sparkle Fest running at the same time right after. Um, it goes from 9 to 12, and that is a free event for children and families of all ages. Um, and the purpose of this is just to kind of, I wanted to give back to the community. I want, even though it is placed in East Bridgewater, which is where we, where, where we are from, I really just wanted to make myself different from a couple of other nonprofits in the area and really share her sparkle within the Bridgewater community. So I ask you today, if you know somebody, um, who could benefit from a scholarship if you know somebody um, in the different schools. Um, I know we unfortunately were just newborn to, to, to 12, but it, the word does travel fast. If you know if you're in high school and you want to come help volunteer um, the help that day, or if you just want to get a group of people through the sports, or just to kind of support us, I really appreciate it. If anybody has any questions, they can um, find us at sydneycraven.com and um, reach out. Thank you so much, Thank Ms. You. Craven. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks to thank you so much. That's okay. You did great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Swenson, do we have anything else under rec uh, recognition or correspondence? Yes, uh, Madam Chair. Last but very not least, we have in our audience um, this evening members of a national championship team. We have our Bridgewater Raynham Regional High School cheerleaders who are here, who were, went down to Dallas, Texas in January and brought home a national championship. So this evening. And I'm not sure if their coach, Coach Manhart, is here. Deputy Federation, I'm the assistant coach. 
Could you come down to the podium? Thanks. It's fun being the assistant, right? <laughs> Just talk about the girls. Talk about the girls. <laughs> um, so last year we went to the same competition and um, we were in high hopes to have been successful and we got third place. Um, total learning experience, we were super excited to go back and so going back and winning was just icing on the cake for these juniors that were, they were juniors last year so they're seniors this year. We're graduating a big class, it's gonna be six girls. So we're hoping for a good upcoming season. Um, there was a lot of work to get down there. It was hard work and we had to um, work hard in the community, ask for a lot of money, stuff like that. So um, we're just hoping that we can keep Bridgewater Raynham Regional High School and the community proud of us at anything else that we go to. <laughs> can we have the sure. cheerleaders come down? Do you, yeah, come on, you guys. Have, come on up and shake the hands of the committee. Thank you. So many excellent, outstanding students. We do. Now you could learn about civics and civic duty, or you can go home and do your homework. Which one do you want to do? <laughs> Good to go. <laughs> Yes, Madam Chair, we have so many incredible students that it's the best part of the meeting for me anyway, Absolutely. each and every month, so thank you. And that's all we have on the correspondence and recognition. Very good, thank you. Next on our agenda, we have public comment. If anyone wishes to address the committee, please come to the podium, state your name and address for the minutes. Do you have a question or comment? We are considering, and ask the committee members to think about this, of possibly moving public comment to the end of the meeting. We moved it early because we thought that would be more convenient for people if they had something they wanted to address us about, but yet items may come up during the course of the meeting that people want to question or comment on. So it seems as though it might be um, more appropriate to move it to the end of the meeting, but I ask the committee members to think about that and uh, we can uh, talk more about that later. And if any members of the community have any feelings about that one way or the other, please uh, let us know as well. Seeing no one wanting to address us at this time, we continue with educational reports and we have our Student Advisory Council report, Mrs. Holbrook. Yes, and my friends are here this <laughs> evening. Um, I hope you all enjoyed your well-deserved uh, break. And tonight, our wonderful Student Advisory Council will be reporting to us about all the wonderful happenings at the high school. Sam will begin with you tonight. Thanks. Good evening. Uh, as you guys know, uh, we want to give a big congratulations to the varsity cheerleading squad. Uh, they took home first place at the national championship from their trip to Dallas last month. So congratulations to them. And we would also like to recognize other teams uh, from this past winter season. Uh, the BR girls and boys basketball teams both qualified for their state tournaments. The girls will, are playing tomorrow night at 6.30 against Marshfield at Monty Gymnasium. And the boys are playing tonight against Catholic Memorial High School at Catholic Memorial. And uh, my latest inside sources told me uh, they were down by five and a half, but they'll be okay. <laughs> and uh, also the BR swim team participated in the state championship two weeks ago. Many swimmers did extremely well. And as you know, freshman Megan Kramer won the division one state title in the 100 yard breaststroke and second place in the 200 yard individual medley and had a fourth place finish in the 200 free relay with Shannon George 
Dwayne McNeil and Hannah Kramer, and also uh, the boys team, uh, myself along with James McLaren, Shai Katua, and Nick Shavs, we qualified for the uh, 200 free relays, medley relay as well. Uh, and the BR and West Bridgewater gymnastics team took home a second place finish at the South sectionals and will move on to the state championship next week. One of BR's favorite events will be taking place in just a few weeks. This is the Mr. BR competition, where myself, along with other boys, will compete for the coveted title of Mr. BR. The event includes fun and entertaining segments and skits from the boys, as well as a dance performance from the senior girls. Mr. BR is not only a memorable opportunity for the senior class, but is also one of the largest and most successful fundraisers for our, our athletic department, typically raising approximately $10,000. The show is run by FOBRA, and the event will take place on Friday, March 16th at 6.30 p.m. Tickets will go on sale approximately one week prior to the show and cost $10 per person. We look forward to announcing the winner at our next presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam, and good luck in that competition. <laughs> Good evening, school committee. My name is Ryan Lasivita, and today I'll be giving updates on uh, BR's Drama Club and Rainwater. So the BRRHS Drama Club will be presenting the Hope and Heartache Diner on Friday and Saturday, March 23rd, March 24th, at 7 o'clock p.m. in the BRRHS Auditorium. Tickets for the show are $8 in advance and $10 at the door. They will be available soon on the BR website uh, and from any cast and crew member. And Rainwater is hosting a Zumba class fundraiser. Spring is right around the corner, so come to Zumba on Saturday, March 3rd from 10 to 11 a.m. in the BR Gymnasium. Doors will open at 9.30, and tickets are now available from any cast or crew member. They will also be available at the door. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Good evening, school committee. My name is Emma Snellgrove, and tonight I'll be reporting on TJ Squared. After the six-week build period that ended on February 20th, the TJ Squared robotics team bagged their 23rd robot and now cannot touch it until competition. They also submitted several award entries during this time, including the Chairman's Award, the Dean's List Award, the Entrepreneurship Award, and the Woody Flowers Award. TJ Squared also received major financial supports from the sponsors. The team is competing at the WPI New England District Robotics Competition at WPI from March 2nd to the 3rd and in the Southeast Massachusetts New England District Robotics Competition at BR from March 11th and the 12th. They hope to qualify for the New England Dist District Championship held at the BCU Aganis Arena and then further qualify for the World Championship in Detroit. They want to thank everyone for the flood of support they have received so far this season. Thank you. Thank you, thank Emma. Emma. Good evening, school committee. My name is Rachel Macefield, and tonight I'll be talking to you about our advisory presentation. Today, BR held a full period advisory for all of its students so that each grade could participate in an informative and important presentation. The freshman and senior class watched the film If They Had Known, and the sophomore and junior classes attended an assembly presentation put on by Bridging Lives and Corey Palazzi and his mother. Both presentations centered around the current drug addiction and opioid crisis that have stricken our nation. Students were then asked to reflect on what they saw and learned. These informative presentations are all part of the partnership that BR and Bridging Lives has forged to help bring awareness to our community on resources and information regarding the opioid crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Rachel. Rachel. Good evening, school committee. My name is Katie Swart, and tonight I'll be presenting to you the Teacher of the Month, National Honor Society, and National Judicial Outreach Week. This month, English teacher Mr. Burke was chosen as the Teacher of the Month at the high school. Each month, the student council asks students to vote for which teacher they would like to receive this coveted position. Mr. Burke was chosen because the students appreciate his enthusiasm in the classroom and his interesting storytelling. We want to congratulate Mr. Burke on this accolade. Over the past month, the National Honor Society collected over six boxes of school supplies to donate to students in schools in Peru. This was just one of the amazing fundraisers that this group has been a part of since the start of the school year. 
On Mar through March 4th and 10th, it's National Judicial Outreach Week. Bridgewater Raynham is fortunate to have secured a presentation for some of its history classes from Judge Greg Pasquale, <coughs> who will speak to the students about our national judicial system and the importance of an impartial and independent judiciary governed by the rule of law. This concludes our February presentation. Thank you for listening to us, and we'll be back next month. Thank, thank you, Katie. Katie. And thank you, Mrs. Holbrook. Always great to hear about all the <coughs> awesome things going on at our high school. And next we have our <coughs> Excel program update with Mr. Barber. Good evening. My name is uh, Bill Barber, and I'm the director of the Excel program, which is you know, the alternative high school at Bridgewater Rainium. I think the first thing that I should say is that the communities of Bridgewater and Rainium should be very, very proud that our district has this program and has had this program since 1997. Um, over that number of years, we've graduated well over 700 students with diplomas. And I would say it would be fair that at least 80% of those probably would have ended up as dropouts and would have been fledgling individuals looking for jobs out there without that diploma. Um, so it's because of the district and the two towns supporting this program uh, that we have helped those students. And you might say, well, what, what students go to an alternative high school? And everyone has this view. We have students that come to us for many reasons. It could be for the fact, and we've had that, where students are working 40 hours a week to help their parents pay the mortgage, and they're trying to go to day school. Well, we all both, we both know, all of us know, that that's not gonna happen. Something's gonna give, and it's usually the classroom that's gonna give because the mortgage payments and helping the parents is more important. So the fact that the district has the alternative program, these students can come to the evening program work during the day and get that diploma and then move on from there. We have students that just socially just don't fit in during the day. What's their alternative? Where can they go? Do they just drop out? Again, we're very fortunate that we have that alternative school. You can look around the area. There are not many schools that offer this. We have students with mental health issues. And again, we can help them. We're supportive. We're probably the only uh, alternative high school in the state that has an adjustment counselor on our staff. So students can have someone when they come in the evenings to sit down and talk to. And it's also a resource to those parents who are struggling with a student possibly at home that we could help out. So you can see that it's multifaceted as far as why the students come the, to the alternative high school. And we can also see that it's very successful. Why is it so successful? I will tell you the success comes from the staff. And it comes from the support of the individuals over the past 25 years of the school committees and the superintendents. They have stood by this program during the times when there were cuts and there were, it was drastic cuts. <coughs> they always said no. We need that alternative high school. We need a place, as our original director, Mr. Capen, would say, students need a second chance. If we don't have this program, they're not going to have a second chance. <coughs> so again, because of the school committees over the years, this program has flourished. We started with seven individuals. Right now, we average anywhere from 30 to 35 students each semester. And those students are not just from Bridgewater Rainham. And I will tell you, and I, and I will personally thank Dr. Forbes at this time, because at one point in our juncture, because of our students coming from the other towns surrounding us, our MCAS scores and our dropout rate was affected by that. And because of that, 
it sort of put a black eye on our district, when in fact it shouldn't have given us a black eye because it was at that time that the superintendent said, you know, this program is far more important to these students who are coming to you. And if we have to take a little hit once in a while, then we're going to do it. And it was because of that we continue to let students transfer from local communities, East Bridgewater, West Bridgewater, Middleborough, Silver Lake, Oliver Ames. They're able to transfer and come to our program and graduate and get a diploma from our program. So I, I, again, personally going back, and I think that the school committee sometimes doesn't get the recognition for small programs. I don't consider it a small program. I consider it probably one of our most important programs in our district. But again, it's the school committee that stood by it. If you come to our graduations, and we do two a year, we do one in January, and we do one in June. And it's because when students fulfill their graduation requirements, they're done. They can move on. They can go to the military. They can go on to college. They can go on to work. I had a young man tonight from another town who's here for his first semester. And he comes in, and he's looking pretty disheveled and dirty. And he said, Mr. Barber, I'm sorry I'm late. And he was 10 minutes late. And I said, well, what's the problem? He says, well, you know, I'm a plumber during the day. I'm working with my dad. And I need my diploma to get into the union. Mm -hmm. He's been working with his dad for two years. Here's an individual, once he gets his diploma, he's going to be very successful. If it wasn't for this program, he wouldn't get his diploma, and he could never get into the union. So again, that's just certain examples. And I can, I can go on. We had a young lady, graduated in 2000. She moved down to Atlanta, got married, had two children moved back here, had another child. She called me two years ago and she said, Mr. Barber, I want to become a nurse. I have my diploma, right? And I said, yes, you do. She said, can you send my transcript? She just got accepted. She had to do all kinds of prerequisites because she hadn't been in school for a long time. She just got accepted full time to nursing program. Our students know that graduate from the Excel program that we're always there for them, the staff, the teachers, they know 100% that we're there, so they can always come back to us. And I think that's what makes this program successful. It's the individuals that work with the students. One student said five years ago, she walked in, and I said, how's it going today? And she looked at me, and she said, Mr. Barber, it's the only time all day I feel safe and supported. I guess that's all we need to know. <clears throat> So I take this opportunity, really, to give you a little information about the program and the success of the program, and really to thank publicly the school committee, as I do because, you know something, they show up at the graduations, they're there at graduations, and I hear from them all the time. It's one of their favorite events that they go to. And I can assure you they have the graduation here. This is completely full. We have well over 150 individuals attending graduation from anywhere from 9 to 13 or 14 students that graduate. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer any for you. Thank you, Mr. Barber. There's one thing that you neglected to say in that this, you, um, this is a, has been a labor of love for you, and mm -hmm. you put your heart and soul into it. And you picked up the mantle from Mr. Capon many years ago, and you've contributed so much to the success of the program, and we want to thank you right. for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Barber, I just want to say thank you to your, you and Mrs. Origi <coughs> and Mrs. Stetz and all the teachers um, that, again, as Madam Chair just said, it's a labor of love for you folks. And you're right, the two graduations a year are some of our favorite events. And I, I, when I speak to the, to the students that night, I always tell them that when I was a building principal, I used to have a sign on my desk that said, the best thing you can give someone is a second chance, and that's what your mm -hmm. program does. And it saves so many lives over its duration. So thank you for everything you. you've done. Thank you, Bill. Okay, continuing with our agenda, next we have a centralized in kindergarten registration report by Ms. Meg Cohen. Hi, Meg. A little presentation, so you want us to go? If you wouldn't mind.
go around. <laughs> As you know, um, it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight um, and to reintroduce you to our online registration process that we have um, are doing currently for the kindergarten for the 2018-2019 school year. Um, we have been um, using an online registration process for the last three years. Um, and I think at this point we have found uh, a program that really um, makes the process efficient um, and is, uh, appreciates the people's time and we don't want to waste it. So we have developed the method here that simplifies um, the whole uh, sometimes emotional process, especially for kindergarten parents, uh, for their child entering school. So um, I thought that instead of going, you know, a visual for it would be a, a great benefit. Um, so I've just put together a few slides that should pop up at any moment. <laughs> you know how good I am at filling time. <laughs> so, anytime. So, no jokes. <laughs> no good ones, anyways. Um, but um, we, with Power School that we adopted in July 2017, uh, that also gave us the opportunity. Um, to use a new registration um, portal. And this registration portal, um, oh my God. this new registration portal um, is almost totally paperless. We could go that way, but you know, we don't want to go crazy. So we're taking it in steps. And the first option uh, that we have introduced this year is to um, allow parents and families and guardians to upload the documents. Um, so that's what they do. So if you wouldn't mind, Michael, clicking on the bar. Yeah, that's good. Yep, that's fantastic. Okay. Technology is a good thing, isn't it? So well behaved. <laughs> okay. Well, that's weird. Okay. So, anywho, uh, registration for kindergarten opened on February sixth. Uh, the way we got the word out for that was through. Um, the district website, it was published there. Oh, great, that's fantastic. <laughs> Thought it would never happen, okay. <laughs> it was worth the wait though, wasn't it? <laughs> God, I love you. Click on that. Okay, so registration did begin February 6th. We got the word out, which was uh, something where in the new ways of the world, um, we used to send out that letter and backpack it home to families and have it available. Um, we didn't do that this year because the way to get the word out now is through online Facebook posting. So if you click again, we got the word out. Click again. We went to these places, the district website, the bus, 
um, our Facebook page as a district, um, both residence pages of Rainham and Bridgewater, and we also did a mailing to the surrounding preschools, okay, with the help of uh, transportation. <laughs> then, now when you go to the website, there's uh, a couple of places you can uh, click on to get that. I've chosen to go under our parents. You'll see we've done a little revising of our website, um, which is an ongoing process. But if you go to parents and you, you'll see the link there for 2018, 2019 kindergarten registry, they'd click there. They could also go under click links, it's there. It's also under headlines, so there's a couple of places. But go ahead to the next slide. Once they click there, they'll go to an information page which leads them to this login page. It's very friendly, very professional. We click on that, they either can create an account or sign in. If they have a child already in the district, they just sign in and register their new student. So we click ahead. So as you can see, this is just a regular demographic page, but you'll see across the top there's a number of other pages and we did it instead of having a long page it kind of breaks it up for people um, what I really we're gonna hop to here because everything's kind of straightforward is upload documents so woo um, <laughs> this is really exciting um, that we're able to do this so you see we remind people of those required documents and it's very easy you see that um, upload documents link there. They just click on that. They can browse whatever device they're on, their computer, their tablet, mm -hmm. the phone. They don't have to have it in like a PDF. They can just take a picture. We've had some funny ones where people take a picture and you can see like it's on their kitchen table. They got the Cheerios there. <laughs> That's kind of funny. But so they can take a picture and they easily upload it. There's no trouble. Um, and uh, I just showed you the top section, but they also have to, of course, produce the two <coughs> proofs of uh, residency, uh, immunization, other documents they can upload is a custody or an IEP or a 504, if those are applicable. But um, it's easy as that. Once they have those uploaded, um, and let's say you might not have everything right there, you're like, darn. I need to go get something else. You can just save at this point, quick come back. They don't have to have everything at once. So then we go to our next screen. Let's say they do and everything's good. They hit review and submit. This says, do you have someone else? Maybe you have twins. You can, <laughs> hopefully, um, you can click here and register them or maybe you just want to print out for your records a copy of your registration. Once they do hit that submit button, they get a confirmation email that says, thank you for registering. Um, your documents are being processed and reviewed and we'll, the central registration will be in contact with you if there is anything uh, missing or we need some con uh, something confirmed. And we've had to do that in some cases. Um, so that, right there, they're all done. Party over. <laughs> if we go here, this is a view from our, my view in my office's view, we go into the portal as admins and now we can kind of see. Right now you only see ones come in um, because I did this kind of, I cleared everybody else so we didn't get any names or anything. So this was just that one Jane sample. You'll see her sitting there. If I can click bring that one in. Also, once they come in, you'll see down here is a list of everybody that's come in. We're able to review them, check them, and make little notes. Those checked individuals are ones that are completed. Though you'll see one here that check, we're waiting on a residency thing, make a note, we need a lease, and that would call them. Um, the fantastic part, and that's, you'll see here there's 127 at this point that were completed. Between the number of registrations that come in, the preschoolers that will be coming um, up to kindergarten. So far we have a total of 210 kindergartens registered. Um, 
about at the same point we would be at last year, only today we know those are complete registrations. Uh, previously, we'd wait for them to come in and we'd get documents by piecemeal. This we know that 95% of those are complete, so their folders are intact. Uh, we go ahead and we print them out. We make, you know, the old time permanent record for them. We begin that and um, we, they'll receive a, an email to say, you know, everything is in order and please follow this link for more information regarding your uh, students' kindergarten. Um, it would notify them of the open house that will be coming up in May and also other events that the, their school's PTO uh, puts on. Um, and lastly, let me make sure I didn't forget something that was so delightful. Um, oh, click on the last page, this is exciting. Click again. Hey. Okay, <coughs> one more time. One more time. Oh, one more time. Hey. Okay, so as I've already, um, the highlights, like I said, it reduces the confusion, improves the communication for the parents during the process. Um, we're moving closer to a totally paperless uh, process. Um, a huge amount of the feedback we've gotten back from parents that have called is, um, or sent us an email for one reason or another, is that they just, it's been so convenient that I work in the evening, I don't, I know my oldest son, I had to go in and make a night and it was complicated. This has been really helpful, thank you. Um, we, we have sent a message out um, to both um, town offices um, requesting a list of the kindergarten age students, uh, fam families with kindergarten age students, so we could kind of send a mail out to them and see, catch anyone we're missing and also cross-reference with, with those that have already registered. That's something we'd like to do. Um, but overall, this, the Power School registration portal has been it's worth, uh, worth its weight in gold. Um, it really uh, helps to keep the process organized, helps us to um, compact the time where we have people that have documents um, outstanding, and I think that's a great cost savings. Um, but. Um, that's it, but I just thank you so much for your support and your um, support of us um, coming in um, to Power School. It's been a great, it's been a great relief to use something so reliable. Um, and I'm here if you have any questions. Thank you. What? <laughs> okay. Anyone have any questions for Meg, Mr. Swinson? Just uh, first want to say, <clears throat> as Meg stated, Power School has been a dream this year. Um, we, we appreciate the support of the committee and the communities who have supported our budget last year to allow us to purchase this program. It's a very powerful program, no pun intended, but it is a powerful <laughs> program. And the efficiency and effectiveness for um, Central registration, I know, has been uh, tremendous. And it, it helps us and it helps the parents keep track of things that come in and uh, before submitting, making sure all those documents are in place. And that adds to the overall efficiency of central registration. So I first want to thank Meg, too, for everything that she's done in putting this together. Sue, Sue Villamere, also Mrs. George, I know, has had a lot to do with uh, this as well. So it's a collective team effort down there and uh, we truly appreciate your efforts because I know that it's for the betterment of the district and uh, overall efficiency and effectiveness. So thank you, Meg, and thank you, Ellen, and please thank, thank Sue for us as well. Yeah, I will. Thank you very much. Thank you.
And continuing with our agenda, we have administrative and school committee reports. And first up, a budget subcommittee report from our budget subcommittee chair, Dr. Kurindowski. Uh, thank you. The budget subcommittee met on February 14th. And that committee is myself, Mr. Dolan, Mr. Gelfi, and Mrs. Gilparis. Um, and Mr. Fox attended that evening to update us on the facilities. And we have several voting items. Um, at the Rainham Middle School, two large hot water tanks failed unexpectedly. A replacement tank with more appropriate capacity and triple backup systems has replaced the old tanks. After insurance reimbursements, the final cost is $61,084.86, which will be forwarded to the town of Rainham in the form of a warrant article for the April meeting. So I'd like to make a motion to forward that amount <coughs> to the town of Rainham for a warrant article to replace the hot water tank at the Rainham Middle School. Motion by Dr. Poindowski, second by Mrs. Scliparis. Any discussion? Hearing, uh, Mr. Gelfi. The school the, the meeting is in May, right? Not April. Oh, I'm sorry. Did the I say meeting. April? Annual yes. town meeting is in May. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, Thank I you, I Mr. Gelfi. Any other discussion? Aye. Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Thank you. Also, the elevator at the Bridgewater Middle School requires a new tank, motor, valve, and pump. The repairs will cost a total of $22,491, and this was classified as an emergency repair. Um, this elevator is necessary for students in wheelchairs, and although the students, this was before vacation, although the students were currently being chairlifted, um, the repairs, that is neither a safe or long-term solution, and I'd like to make a motion to the full committee for the bill of the repairs of $22,491 be sent to the town of Bridgewater. And that's a motion from yes. Dr. Perwindowski, second, second by Mr. Dolan. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. And also at the Rainham Middle School, uh, an 18-year-old controller needs to be replaced, and that function is to control the lights and parts of the heating system. Uh, this would be a priority one replacement, and a motion to authorize $3,519 for the replacement of the controller at the Rainham Middle School. Motion by Dr. Perwindowski, second by um, Mr. Gelfi. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So Aye. voted. And our last voting item um, is that it was brought to our attention that the backstop hoist replacement, which is the backstop at the basketball court at the Rainham Middle School, has failed and it was stuck in the upright position. Um, Mr. Fox went into great detail of the manual override and whatnot, but anyway, it needs to be replaced. Um, and because that really is an issue that the town of Rainham uses quite a bit for park and rec, uh, I'd like to make a motion to forward the bill of $4,216.50 to the town of Rainham to repair that backstop at the Rainham Middle School. Motion by Dr. Perwindowski, second by Mr. Um, or Dr. Mrs. Uh, Holbrook. Somebody at, this end. <laughs> Somebody at this end. Right, exactly. <laughs> Any discussion? Uh, hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. I just want to give everybody a chance here. <laughs> and I just have some very brief informational items. Uh, Mr. Bennett attended our meeting, and the progress is being made with the telephone poles for the internet. Um, the town of Bridgewater has been very kind to allow the district to borrow some fiber to expedite the increase in bandwidth at the high school. Uh, TMLP is demonstrating a desire to pick up the district's Comcast contract. So moving forward, we hope that our internet has a better capacity and speed. Um, so we're looking forward to that. We had a lengthy discussion about the middle school sports program. Um, the, we're in the basketball season now, and what we're going to do is we're going to wait and gather some more information. And for those who don't know, this is a self-funded program uh, that we ask the parents um, through fees and fundraising. And then the district has a small portion that we cover. And we just want to make sure that this is a solvent program and that it really does pay for itself. 
So at the end of the basketball season, we'll look again and see if there's anything better. Can we have better communication with the different parent groups? How much do we need to raise for the spring sports to make up if there's a shortfall? So we'll be looking at that closely as well. We did have a discussion on the FY18, our current budget, and so far everything is fine. And then we did have a discussion on the FY19 budget. And as everyone knows, we will be doing our FY19 budget presentation next Wednesday. And we look forward to going into much greater detail about the FY19 budget. And that is my report. Thank you, Dr. Prundowski. Thank you. Continuing, we have a special education advisory report. Mrs. Harris. Uh, yes, I'm just going to share some things that Dr. Kate Dye, the president of the uh, Special Ed Parents Advisory Committee. The group is a positive solution uh, oriented group focused on being a resource for parents and guardians of children with disabilities. And uh, some of the events that they held were uh, special ed parents and guardian council meet the week was held on September 27th. Parents met with the director of student services, Kyle Thomas, um, administrator special ed, Paul, and Dean Madeira is the BRC PAC representatives. Uh, they learned more about district special ed programs and what the BRC PAC can be the upcoming year. Uh, a family special ed night was held on November 2nd at La Liberty. Family um, night provided parents and guidance to the place to gather information from 30 plus organizations that offer services to children with special needs. Children were supervised and engaged in activities like arts and crafts while the parents gathered information. On January 25th, the BRC PAC helped facilitate understanding disabilities fair at the Mitchell Elementary School for third graders. Students spent time rotating between stations and simulated what it might be like to have a particular disability, visual impairment, hearing impairment, um, developmental disability, etc. They hope to do a fourth grade on the Liberty School in the spring. Um, the BRC tag arranged for kids on the block and actually recognized the puppet program to visit the Merrill Liberty Mitchell Schools. The kids teach children about disabilities and a variety of other topics and important to children's learning in today's world. Um, some of the presentations that they've had, uh, that the in here discussed easy to implement <coughs> preventive tools, strategies, and interventions for the society. Uh, they had a self-directed services by DDS, uh, which is the Department of Developmental Services, discussed the three models of service delivery. That would be traditional, agency of choice, participant directed models, and that's more for uh, post when they're no longer eligible in the school district and might need services after age 22. Um, they also had an annual basic rights presentation covered in how special ed laws can support the children. So those are the ones that they had. Um, upcoming ones on March 8th, they have a Making Sense of the Affordable Care Act and Mass Health, so you can learn about eligibility and services and benefits and associated costs. On May 10th, creating a post-secondary vision, learn how families can work with their students to identify strengths, interests, and preferences. On February 6th, Lecture Happy Square Pegs has been canceled and will be scheduled in April and May, where they'll discuss the strengths of autism while sharing positive management strategies to enrich the autistic life. And on May 10th, again, um, they will recognize the BR staff members, band drivers, or other personnel who have gone above and beyond to impact children with a disability in the school district. If anyone would like to nominate someone, um, they would like to do that to the bottom of the page. Um, she really would like to thank the school district of Peter to support the BRC PAC. I mean, they've been very busy. Um, I know there's a lot of costs associated with uh, our special ed, but they are part of our district and just to support. So. Hopefully, people will appreciate all the effort that Kate and others have put into addressing the needs of those special students. Thank you, Mrs. Scoop-Harris. Any questions? I know Mrs. Dyer couldn't be here, but Kate does a fantastic job leading Absolutely. that group, and we greatly appreciate that. Absolutely. Next, we have a safety and security report. Our committee member, Mr. Marrara, who's our committee's representative to the District Safety and Security Committee, and our superintendent, Mr. Swenson. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, I just want to start off by saying that the safety and security for the children in our district are always 
between staff and our officials locally in Raynham and Bridgewater are always at the utmost priority um, for everybody, um, especially with the events that happened last uh, f um, few weeks ago in Parkland, Florida. With that said, we have been in review of our emergency plans, which started a few months ago from an intern that we had uh, that will assist us. I think Mr. O'Brien Crowley, I think was his name, Mr. Swenson? From um, Mass, Mass Maritime. Maritime, yes. And he had been tirelessly reviewing our emergency plans, and he did a wonderful job in uh, revamping everything, freshening it up. So there will be some stuff coming out uh, in the future that will be on the district uh, site. Uh, but just to also add to that a little bit, there are also some things that will <coughs> not be on the website. There are certain key, f um, key information that pertains to staff and administrators that, to be in all honesty, it's something that we don't want everyone to know of what our procedures and plans are. So there will be a, something coming out for the public, for uh, parents and students to uh, understand what happens during an emergency situation for all types of emergencies, but important key information will be held to staff members on up. Uh, so there will be more information coming out of that. And also, one last thing that I have is a teen cert that we started back in October. Uh, we are at the end of the road, um, and they are gonna be graduating uh, March 8th at 7 p.m. right here in this room. And I'd like to extend the invitation to all the school committee members to come to that graduation. Uh, we have 27 students graduating the program and they are leaving this program uh, with a lot of training to also include uh, CPR, AED, Heimlich Maneuver, and so on. So. Wonderful, that's that excellent. Terrific, thank you, Madam Mr. Mayor. Mr. Dolan. Uh, that was 3-8 at 7 p.m.? Yes, March 8th, right here. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Uh, Dr. Primadowski. Uh, could you just explain to us um, how many times the safety and security meeting meet and who is involved in that, just so in case people aren't aware. We, we've been doing this for several years, I believe. So the safety and security committee, um, as, it's, as itself, meets every quarter. And it's with all administrators and uh, leads from every, every school in the district. So all the principals or assistant principals that they're not able to make it. Plus the public safety officials from both sides of the district. So there's a wide uh, array of, of knowledge and input that goes into those. The meeting that we had with the emergency plans was this afternoon, and it was more of a round table to review uh, a large document, and that's all I'm gonna leave it, it was a very large and lengthy document, um, to review and have input, uh, again, and at that meeting also with uh, key, uh, uh, key officials from Bridgewater and Raynham along with key officials from the uh, administration here. So, and those can be more um, often than not, as needed. So, Mr. Swenson could probably say sure. a little more on that. I was going to say, we do meet quarterly with our um, safety and security team, with our administrative team, and our chiefs for both sides of the districts, and sometimes their seconds in command. Um, through that process, we continuously look at our safety protocols and procedures, constantly updating it. Um, one thing that has come out of um, that safety and security team over the course of the last few years is what we've implemented this year with our ALICE program, which is a uh, shift in the paradigm and it's a little bit different than the traditional lockdown. It gives us an opportunity to um, have other options uh, rather than just locking a door and, and, and waiting for safety officials to come. It started this year. Uh, we, we implemented it um, during our professional development week. We had a professional trainer come out, train our entire staff, and when we say our entire staff, we don't just, we're not just talking about teachers and administrators, we're talking about um, our ESPs, we're talking about our custodial staff, our secretarial folks, because mm. everybody is part of this process, so we want to make sure that they receive that training. Over the course of this school year, we have incrementally begun drilling uh, the, at, at the different uh, schools, along with our school resource officers, which Many people may not know, we're lucky enough to have two school resource officers in our district, one on the Bridgewater side and one on the Rainham side. Kev, Officer Kevin Kearns here in Bridgewater and Detective Louis Pacheco in um, uh, Rainham. Those folks really are instrumental in helping us along with the administrative team um, work with our staff and begin drilling and, and, and practicing some of these strategies uh, through ALICE. We did have two parent information nights uh, in January as well. Uh, Mr. Powers um, did a wonderful presentation um, explaining Alice and explaining uh, why we felt that it was important to go to um, this new program rather than 
getting away from the traditional lockdown. Um, law enforcement and safety officials attended those um, uh, evenings as well, so we're very appreciative of that. <clears throat> One thing I say all the time, I've been to three other, I've worked in three other districts prior to this. I can say the relationship that we have with safety officials on both sides of the district is second to none. It's not always like that in, in some districts. You know, they're, both, they're all municipal departments, we're all looking at, you know, those different pieces of the pie when it comes to budget. Um, but I can tell you, the folks that we have, the you know, we're fortunate enough to work with um, on, on both sides of the district with, you know, Chief Del Monte and Chief Levy here in Bridgewater and Chief Donovan and, and Chief Janice in Rainham. There's always continuous open lines of communication. And even though we meet quarterly, we can talk weekly, daily uh, in, in, in regards to, you know, some situations. Obviously, we had some situations, you know, at the high school prior to leaving for uh, February break, but I will tell you, that it was handled swiftly and appropriately in a collective effort between the building administration, central administration, and law enforcement from both sides of the district. Um, and, and the end result was, was a positive one and a safe one for, for our students. I, I will say this, in terms of that day, um, you know, we know that we, we try to be, um, you know, try to inform uh, our communities when things are happening. I realize that in the day and age that we are in, um, every student has a cell phone on them in those type of situations. They may be contacting, you know, parents and family members uh, with information. We have to make sure when we're in situations like that, that the investigation is done thoroughly. It's done completely before we truly want to put information out to the communities and obviously to our parents and guardians. Um, I realize that can be kind of uh, an anxious time for parents wondering what's happening. Uh, but that particular situation prior to uh, February break, we kind of had an idea of, of where that individual was. Had we put out any information, you know, through an instant alert or social media, that could have really tipped off that individual by holding uh, the line and really truly uh, doing our due diligence and making sure it was a thorough investigation, we were able to apprehend that individual. And then after that, put the communication out to our community so I realize you know we live in a social media world and people want instant gratification but when it comes to certain situations when it comes to safety and security we got to make sure that all our eyes are dotted and T's are crossed before we put um, information on so we would just to let, let parents know you know please please understand that we understand that you um, you know where you give us that your children each and every day and they're within our care and there's no greater responsibility educators can have and, and no bigger fear sometimes parents can have than that. But please know that we work uh, incredibly hard with law enforcement each and every day to make sure that your children come to safe and welcoming environments. Um, one last thing I would just say in, in regards to uh, safety and security. Um, obviously, we're all heartbroken uh, with the tragedy that occurred in Parkland, Florida on uh, February the 14th. And I know a lot of folks nationwide, you know, are talking about different ways that um, we can show support for that community. And we feel the same way here in Bridgewater, Rainham. Um, one kind of an uh, idea and, and, and movement that's kind of gaining some traction, and I put some information out to the parents earlier this week, is that of a um, national, -wide, national wide walkout on Wednesday. March 14th at 10 to 1017 um, as means of memorializing those 17 fallen victims in, in Parkland, Florida. Although we totally understand um, and, and respect the intent behind that effort, I, along with safety officials, are, are really concerned about some of security and safety issues uh, that an action like this may have for our students and staff. Um, I, I'm a true believer in, in First Amendment and all of our constitutional rights, um, but it's my job each and every day to keep 5,500 students and over 500 employees safe and secure. <coughs> That's a huge responsibility and it's one that I take incredibly seriously. And with that being said, I want to be able to have um, our staff at the secondary level at the high school and some of our students, if you know, try to show a, a sense of uh, solidarity for the um, victims in, in Parkland. But I want to make sure that we're doing it in in a safe um, a safe way. With that being said, um, as I stated in my email earlier this week, 
I will be meeting with uh, administrators, safety officials, educators, and actual student representatives uh, over the course of the next few weeks to talk about and brainstorm for some safe ways that we could show an act of solidarity um, that also allows us to happen within a safe and secure environment. Actually, tomorrow I'm having a working lunch with Ms. Watson, Mr. Powers, and our two school resource officers, and all of our class officers at Bridgewater Rainham Regional High School. At that point, um, we're going to kind of brainstorm with them and kind of see where they are with things and see if they can come up with some safe and uh, secure alternatives uh, to, to a walkout uh, on the 14th. Um, once we have some ideas, we'll talk, discuss that with Ms. Watson and her staff, and at that point, um, you know, come up with some ideas, and, and, and that information will then uh, be forthcoming uh, to, to the communities. Right now, really truly, at this stage, for our K-8 population, I'm not in favor of having um, any type of um, movement on the 14th for that population of student. I've had a lot of conversations in the last few days with parents. A lot of parents, including myself, as a parent of an elementary and a middle school student, for my elementary student, I've sheltered her from, from that tragedy down in Florida. They're only babies once, and you really truly have to think about that. And uh, there are parents who feel the same way and have not explained or exposed them to these ideas. And if we're planning things at that K population, mm -hmm. that could create a lot of questions by those students who don't know the information because their parents have prevented them from having that and that's that those parents rights and I respect that and I want us to respect that as well with that being said I have a middle schooler who who has asked some questions and I've had some pretty difficult conversations with him about it and um, you know I, I, I worry about students that we have in our buildings too that really have some high anxiety and those types of things um, those days that though they're they're supposed to be positive in a way can trigger things and our students that are not well prepared to handle those. So I would just ask you know, the communities to understand that, respect that. If a parent wants to, on an individual basis, you know, have some type of way that their child is gonna show solidarity on that day, that's your job and, and your, your responsibility and, 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 and your option as a parent. Um, but I will say that as we stand right now, um, for, for our K-8 population, we're not going to be authorizing, and we're not going to be supporting or promoting any activities at that, at that level. Um, again, I'm gonna have those conversations with our high school students tomorrow to see if there are ideas of things that they wanna do at the high school level, so. With that being said, I just wanted to put that out to the community, because I know there's been a lot of buzz about that on social media as of late, and I have had <clears throat> numerous phone calls and, and emails going back and forth with some parents that are really concerned about that March 14th day. Thank you, Mr. Swenson. Any comments, questions? Mrs. Holbrook. Yes, <clears throat> Mr. Swenson, are there any additional Alice informational nights um, planned for the near future? Oh, I was talking about that with uh, some of our safety officials. Actually, Madam Chair and I met the other day to, to go over the agenda. We talked about possibly having um, some future um, information nights. And I, in speaking with Chief um, Del Monte yesterday and, and uh, Detective Pacheco um, yesterday as well. We may look to have something in the future. We do have a safety and security meeting on the 16th uh, of March. It's something I'm gonna bring up to the committee. And it may be, uh, the safety and security committee, it may be something too where it's not maybe solely just focused on Alice. It may be something informational like this right now about you know, letting parents know that we have a safety and security team, knowing what the role is, what they do, having them be able to ask questions to us, but also provide them with some information about Alice. So I'll bring that up at it as an agenda topic on March 16th with a safety and security team and then circle back to the committee at that point. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Holbrook. Any other questions, comments? Was that? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a transportation report. Mr. Doblin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the transportation subcommittee met this evening. Uh, the committee is made up of Mr. Hammond, Mr. Marrera, Mr. Gelfi, and myself. Um, Ms. George joined us um, for the meeting uh, to give us an update on the 2018-2019 pay-to-ride numbers. Um, for those who have forgotten, pay-to-ride um, closed today. Um, for next academic year. We had 211 completed registrations 
of which six are right now incoming <coughs> kindergartners. Um, those are obviously folks who have older children in the district already and know about the process. Um, the incoming kindergartners um, will uh, go through this process at a later date, um, but they will have the same option to, to, um, to join pay to ride. Of that 211, 57 are on waivers, um, and several um, registrations are incomplete, whether they've paid but haven't filled out the paperwork or filled out the paperwork and haven't paid. Um, there are several of those that Ms. George is working her way through. Um, so again, it's 211 um, with 57 on waiver, which is about 27% <coughs> of that number. Um, eight students. Um, met the family cap, so eight, eight students will be uh, riding the buses, um, uh, pay to ride for free because they've met the family cap. Um, Ms. George also received about 100, between 110 and 120 responses from folks who live within the one and a half mile, um, stating that they were not going to be using the service next year. Um, we are waiting for more of those folks to um, get back to us as well. And then finally, um, policy EEA, transportation of students, um, the committee deferred or sent the policy, I should say, back to the policy subcommittee for review. So the policy subcommittee re will take that up at their next meeting as well. <coughs> and that, that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Dolan. Any questions or comments? Mr. Gelfie? Oh, yes, thank you, sorry. Uh, to be on waivers means that um, the student and their family um, qualifies for free and reduced lunch. Um, and by state statute, Mass General Law, we cannot charge those students for any services that, um, that we provide um, to where they'd have to pay. So those folks, uh, those students qualify based on that. So thank you. Thank you. And that concludes your report? It Mr. does. All right. Thank you very much. Next, we have an OPM subcommittee report. Our Director of Business Services, Ms. Macedo. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the school committee, and Superintendent Swenson. I just want to give you a brief uh, update on what's been happening in um, the school um, building uh, committee. And one of the things here is part of the uh, Massachusetts School Building Authority, the MSBA that we've been working with to help us with the Mitchell Elementary School, as well as state procurement requirements during this feasibility study, um, we are required to hire an OPM, or Owner's Project Manager, uh, for the project. This individual will assist the owner throughout the feasibility stage and potentially through the construction phase of the project by providing project management guidance for the owner. This person or firm must be either registered engineer or architect with five years of experience in construction and supervision of construction of buildings, or if not an engineer or architect, must have at least seven years experience in construction and supervision of construction buildings. Since the owner will be working closely with the OPM throughout the project, the selection of a qualified OPM is one of the most important decisions an owner will make during this time. The Mitchell Elementary School Building Committee selected members to serve on the OPM selection uh, subcommittee back in the fall. The committee consisted of nine members and two of those folks were alternates. The district solicited a type of bid called an RFS, which is a request for services for an OPM. This type of bid is a qualifications-based bid, which differs from the usual invitation to bid, where awards are made based on the most responsive and responsible bidder with the lowest price. So it's based on qualifications versus price. The OPM Selection Committee, um, committee uh, reviewed 12 responses and narrowed those down to six. <coughs> References, uh, checks were made for the six respondents, and the six respondents were interviewed, and a final ranking was compiled from the member's scores. The highest ranked firm was Daedalus Projects, Inc., and they're from Boston, Massachusetts. 
Negotiations with Daedalus and the district were completed and the district was able to secure a contract which was under budget by $20,000 uh, for the amount of 178000 The required MSBA narrative of the procurement process was completed and submitted to the MSBA for review and revision in time to be scheduled for the MSBA panel review meeting which will be held this Monday on March 5th at um, 2.05. <laughs> In the afternoon. As part of the panel review meeting, the MSBA will require Daedalus Projects to deliver a 15-minute presentation that will incorporate five of their questions, one of which is uh, to deal with the description of the firm and any sub-consultant use, schedule and timeline for the project, reference to similar uh, recent projects that they've done, description of how they will help us be successful, and identification of two programmatic uh, requirements that are not currently being met and how they will be addressed in this feasibility study. Uh, the contract with the OPM will need to be fully executed uh, once we have MSBA approval and the district will be doing that. And I believe this evening you have in front of you a vote um, to approve Daedalus projects as our OPM. Thank you, Ms. Macedo. Yes, I'd like to ask for a motion <coughs> to approve the selection of Daedalus Projects Incorporated and to authorize the Director of Business Services to enter into a contract with Daedalus Projects Incorporated pending the acceptance of the OPM selection by the MSBA on March 5, 2018. Do we have a motion? Motion by Mrs. Holbrook, second by <coughs> Mrs. Scleparis. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Ms. Ms. Macedo. Macedo. Okay, next on our agenda, we have a treasurer's report. From our treasurer, Mr. Conlon. Madam Chair, school committee members, Superintendent Swenson. Um, I just wanted to review the um, school parent booster organizations Education Foundations, um, especially Section K, which is the Community Relations, and specifically um, Section KBE Number Four. Um, organizations shall, sh I'm sorry, organizations shall submit copies of organizational documents, including articles of incorporation and bylaws, to the committee, and changes, if any, to those documents. Uh, most notably, on an annual basis, no later than January 1st, uh, organizations shall submit copies of federal and state filing forms, cash reconciliations, and bank statements for the end of the organization's fiscal year and appropriate annual financial reports for the prior fiscal year. Uh, the school committee reserves the right to request additional documentation. I just want to make sure that the committees and the school committee know that and they, I get all the financial statement sent to the treasurer's office. Some I haven't received, and I'll be sending out um, memos or emails to those committees to get those, um, that information into my office because we need that also for the audit. So I just want to report on that. So, so we're talking about parent groups, boosters? Yes, yes, yep. yep. Thank you, Mr. Conley. Any questions? I said when I, an update on I know that a couple of years ago we shifted to the the biannual payment for preschool mm -hmm. can you just kind of give us a quick update as to where we are with that um, all all preschool is up to date there are, I think there are only two right now that haven't paid this has been phenomenal really taking care of a yeah. lot of outstanding um, bills there are two that are still being worked on. Um, no special treatment or any, they're just being worked on right now. Um, but everything is, is up to date. I mean, all the students, except for those, the two, were, everybody's paid. And, and I know it was tough for a lot of uh, parents, individuals, um, you know, com somehow come up with that payment. But they've, they've done a great job. I mean, they've, they've worked it out and, you know, I, I, it's been very good. And upon registration, they're, they're aware that the, of the payment yes. scale, so yes. instruction. Yep. Thank you, yep. Mr. Conner. Thank you, Mr. Conner. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next, we have 
we have no personnel report this evening. Uh, so we go to unfinished business and we have a vote to approve policy AC-A. And Dr. Perwindowski is going to review with us what that is. Thank you. Um, we had a first reading at the previous school committee and this will be the second reading and there were no changes. And basically what this is is just a, an addition to our current um, <coughs> harassment policy and it was felt that we needed to have more specific language for a sexual harassment policy of the district and that is what uh, Mary presented us at the previous meeting and with the second reading uh, make a motion to approve the sexual harassment policy of the Bridgewater Rainham Regional School District AC-A. So we have a motion by Dr. Perwindowski, second by Mr. Dolan. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Thank you. Thank you. And if I could uh, beg the committee's indulgence for a brief little report on some information um, that I gathered from the fall conference at the Massachusetts Association of School Committees. A number of the presentations and discussions focused on social emotional issues, which we've mentioned here this evening, and the national public health emergency of addiction. One particular keynote speech focused on the opioid crisis and the coming of marijuana. The presenters included Dr. John Kelly, an associate professor of psychiatry and addiction medicine at Harvard Medical School and the founder and director of the Recovery Research Institute at Massachusetts General Hospital, Joanne Peterson, the founder and executive director of Learn to Cope Incorporated, and Marion Ryan, Middlesex County District Attorney. The information presented can serve, can serve as supporting evidence, I believe, for our superintendent's request for and the budget subcommittee's support of that request to add new positions to our district to address the social emotional health of our students, specifically the request for two school psychologists and two school adjustment counselor social worker positions. In his report on addiction, opioids, cannabis, and youth, Dr. Kelly explained that powerfully seductive, addictive, legal, and potentially <laughs> lethal opioid medications became too widely prescribed and available, easily accessible, and promoted as non-addictive and safe in an effort to treat what was determined to be the public health problem of unrelieved pain. In 1997, a collaborative project had been initiated to integrate pain assessment and management into medical standards, leading in 2001 to all patient care organizations determining pain man management to be the fifth vital sign in the health of their patients. Prescription opioids were perpeted and perceived to be safe and non-addictive, and it led to over-prescription. According to studies referenced by Dr. Kelly, of all misused drugs besides alcohol, prescription drugs are the second most common, and of all opiates, prescription pain relievers are the most, community, uh, most commonly misused. In 2016, national trends in substance abuse identified 13.9% of substance <coughs> use involving marijuana and 6.9% involving the misuse of prescription drugs. Although the rate of overdose deaths is 10 times higher among individuals addicted to heroin compared to prescription drugs, prescription opioid use, opioid use is 10 times higher than heroin use, suggesting an equal need to reach and intervene with both groups. The statistics are staggering. Almost a tripling in the total number of overdose deaths from any opioid drugs between 2002 and 2015. What is particularly disturbing to those in involved in and concerned about educating our youth is that almost 10 to 15 percent of high school seniors misuse prescription opioids. In the general adult population, the percentage is 5 percent. Interestingly, boys and girls show similar trends in prevalence of use with boys only slightly higher in recent years. Then there's the serious question of how changing attitudes and laws regarding marijuana will impact future use and abuse. According to the Institute of Medicine, adolescents, especially troubled ones, and people with psychiatric, psychiatric disorders, including substance abuse, appear more likely than the general population, population to become dependent on marijuana. According to studies, the prevalence of marijuana use more than doubled between 2000 one and 2013, and there was a large increase in marijuana use disorders during that time. Once again, a particular concern is that 90% of individuals with substance use disorders began smoking, drinking, or using other drugs before the age of 18. 
and the severity of abuse is greatest among those in the 18 to 20 age category. Accumulating evidence from both animal and human studies suggests that heavy use during adolescence is associated with more severe and persistent negative outcomes, suggesting that the adolescent brain may be particularly vulnerable to the effects of cannabis exposure. Indications are that marijuana users show worse performance on memory tests and that early onset marijuana users, those using before under the age of 16, show impaired learning compared to non-users. Students using marijuana could have difficulty attending to and learning new information. Particularly concerning, recent reports show that fewer adolescents believe that regular cannabis use is harmful to health. At the same time, adolescents are initiating <coughs> cannabis use at younger ages, and more adolescents are using cannabis on a daily basis. Some studies indicate that even when recent marijuana use was taken into account, along with other factors, heavy use during teen years was associated with an 8% drop in IQ. Obviously, all of this requires all of us to do nothing less than everything we can to try to address these issues, and those requested positions in our budget proposal would be one important step. I also mentioned earlier Joanne Peterson, who also spoke at the conference about the personal experience, personal experience she had dealing with a child with an opioid addiction and how she took that very difficult situation and took action. Learn to Cope is a nonprofit, peer-led support network, which she began in 2004 and is now funded by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and has grown to having a full staff who collaborate with communities all across the state to spread messages of prevention, education, awareness, and advocacy. Learn to Cope, which is headquartered right next door in Taunton, has over 9,900 members on a private online forum, 25 chapters throughout Massachusetts, two chapters in Florida, and one in Boise, Idaho. I spoke with Joanne today, who actually is from Rainham, and her children attended our schools, and asked her if she could set up a meeting with our superintendent to see how we can possibly help spread the word about the resources her agency provides, and see if there's anything that we can partner with them to do to provide more assistance and more resources for our district and for our families. I would like to, if we could, just mention her website at this point, um, and more information is available at www.learn2, the numeral 2, cope.org, and the number for the Taunton office, which is 508-738-5148. She's conferenced with people across the state, across the country, actually, and she's a wealth of information. So I look forward to working with Joanne and having her agency work with our district. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next on our agenda, we have new business. And we have a vote to approve school choice for the 2018-2019 school year. Ms. Macedo. Yes, I believe you received a memo regarding um, the upcoming uh, FY 2018-2019 school choice program. And again, based on the estimated class sizes for next year, uh, administration has determined that we will need to limit school choice to grades 9 through 12. Um, class sizes at lower levels or at capacity. Um, so the recommendation is to continue with this program for 2018-2019 for participation in grades 9 through 12. And that's your recommendation as well, Mr. Swenson? Yes, Madam Chair. Do we have a motion? Motion, motion by Mr. Dolan, second by Mr. Oh, Mr. Gelfi and Mrs. Scalaris. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a proposal of, for the 2018 2019 school calendar. Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped you. Skip one other thing. One other While thing. While you're there, Ms. Macedo, okay. school lunch bid. Well, it's been uh, five years ago. I came before you to request approval to go out to bid for this food service management company for our school lunch program, and I'm back again here tonight uh, to ask for the same thing. Uh, we will need to be looking at going out to bid for the 2019 through 2023 school year. It's hard to imagine, but it will come and go quickly, I'm sure. Um, what, um, just some particulars, uh, we're going out to bid using an RFP, which is a request for proposals versus an IFB. I think we talked a little bit about this with the OPM, it's kind of a similar situation. 
Uh, with the RFP model, um, it'll benefit the district in many ways. Most importantly, it allows us to weigh the relative merits of the proposal and award based on the most advantageous proposal, taking into consideration the relative merits and, and prices. Um, this may or may not result in an award for the proposer with the lowest price. So we're looking at quality and price um, when we do an RFS, uh, RFP. Uh, the determine, uh, to determine which company is most advantageous, we will have evaluative criteria similar to what we had in the OPM process to determine who will be the successful proposer. A committee will need to be formed to review the proposals. This committee will include various school and central office um, administrators, maybe custodial or maintenance staff, secretary, and possibly um, a few of our students. Uh, they will be required, the proposers, to submit two sealed envelopes. One will be for a non-price proposal, and the second will be for a price proposal. At the non-public proposal opening, only the non-price proposal envelope may be opened. Each proposal will be then reviewed by each committee member and will receive scores pertaining mm -hmm. to each evaluative criterion. Scores are typically not numeric but are depicted by the terms unacceptable, not advantageous, advantageous, or highly advantageous. And there will be descriptions to help the committee members know which um, score to, which category to choose. Once the proposals are ranked and rated, uh, the price proposals may be reviewed. A highly advantageous proposer may also have a high price over and just an advantageous proposal with a low price. This is going to be a decision that um, everyone in the district is going to have to, in the committee, will have to be looking at because it may be something where we don't need to have the highest advantageous person with the high price. We may just <coughs> be very happy with an, someone who's advantageous that has a really good price for us. So those decisions we'll have to be making at that point. Um, the plan here is to receive approval this evening to go out to bid. Um, it is a five-year contract and therefore a potentially five-year contract. It will be a one-year contract with four one-year renewals. And uh, because of that, we need to have school committee approval. Uh, once we have that, we will advertise in the local newspaper, website, and in the Goods and Services Bulletin, and we hope to do that by March 8th. A site visit will take place on March 14th at 1 p.m. And, an and the RFP will be due on March 26th at uh, 1 p.m. Once reviewed by the committee, the successful candidate will be brought to school committee for award at its March 28th meeting. These dates are all pending, uh, being able to get that advertisement in the Goods and mm. Services Bulletin because we don't always have control of when they can put that in. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's, so that's what we need this evening, a vote to um, allow me to go out to bid. Thank you, Ms. Macedo. Oh, so we're looking for a motion mm -hmm. to approve going out to school lunch bid um, along the manner described by Ms. Macedo. Mm -hmm. And that comes with your recommendation as well, Mr. Yes, Swinson. Sure. Motion by Mr. Marrera, second by Dr. Perwandowski. Any discussion? Mr. Yes, Dolan. Madam Chair, Ms. Macedo, you said that the bids were opened in a non-public form? Yes, it's in a non-public meeting okay. that they get opened because they may have trade secrets in there that they okay. don't want other bidders to know okay. about. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dolan. Any other questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Thank, Thank you, you, Mrs. Eden. Now, proposal for the, of the 2018-2019 school calendar. First reading, our assistant superintendent, Mr. Powers. <laughs> Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the school committee, Superintendent Swenson. I uh, am here tonight before you to present the proposed 2018-2019 academic year calendar and calendar of important events. Um, you should have two pages in your packet. I will actually start with the academic year calendar, and I certainly won't go uh, week by week, but I'll give you some highlights uh, of the proposed calendar. Uh, you'll see starting at the end of August, uh, we're proposing that staff will return on August 28th, which is a Tuesday, for the opening convocation and building-based meetings. And then we will start our professional development days. Uh, as you know, we have three days built in to the calendar prior to school starting. And there's a, a, a little bit different uh, uh, plan this year, and I'll explain why. Uh, we're going to begin professional development on Wednesday, August 29th. 
continuing on Thursday, August 30th, um, as you know, Friday uh, contractually is a uh, no work day. Um, that leads us into the Labor Day weekend. So Monday, September 3rd is the Labor Day holiday. We typically start school on that Tuesday after Labor Day. However, this year it is actually a primary election. And although we've held, held school on prior uh, primary elections, uh, in talking with Mr. Swenson and talking with the building administration, we just felt like having it on a f the first day of school uh, really wasn't uh, you know, beneficial to us. Uh, we felt as though that, that first day of school, especially for our little ones, is so much about routine. And obviously, I know at the Mitchell, Ms. Latenders using the gymnasium, uh, as well as you know, uh, Ms. Charette at, at RMS, but we just felt like it really would have a detrimental impact to have a primary on the first day of school. Um, so therefore, uh, continue our professional development, so it will be a day for teachers and staff. Um, however, students will not start until Wednesday, September 5th, uh, for our students in grades 1 through 12, and then our pre-kindergarten, kindergarten students will start on Thursday the 6th, September 6th. And that uh, moving along in our, into October, um, as you can see there, Monday, October 8th is the Columbus Day holiday. Uh, the next uh, day indicated on the calendar is Thursday the 18th, uh, and you'll see that as an early release day for professional development. The school committee was uh, gracious enough to give us an additional uh, professional development day this year in our calendar, and so we're proposing to keep uh, having two additional half days this year, one occurring in October. Uh, moving into November, you see that we do have an early release day scheduled for Thursday, November 1st, and that is actually for parent-teacher conferences. Uh, one thing that I, I did want to just point out is we're actually going to hold parent-teacher conferences for our pre-K <coughs> to 8 students a little bit early, uh, earlier this year, um, only because we received feedback not only from our staff but also from our parents. They felt like having a parent-teacher conference after the first trimester um, they felt there was maybe too much time uh, had gone by before they actually had any contact with the teachers. And actually the teachers had come to me at our lead teacher meeting and, and presented the same. So I, I know in years past, prior to my arrival, parent-teacher conferences were actually, uh, had taken place before report cards were issued. So we'll go back to that model. Um, again, it, seeing how it works for us. Uh, but I think it'll actually work uh, favorably. So Thursday the 1st will be a uh, early release day for all students. However, it will be pre-K to eight, I'm sorry, K to eight parent-teacher conferences, and then obviously high school will have a professional development day as part of their um, accreditation process. And then Monday the 12th is Veterans Day, so we will have no school that day. And then the following week we get into another early release day. You know, contractually we have an early release day before the Thanksgiving Day break, and then that Thursday, Friday we are off, <coughs> which brings us into December. Uh, the first really day to pay attention to is Friday, December 21st. Um, again, contractually, we have an early release day before winter break, uh, before the December break, so therefore we'll have an early release day on the 21st, and then be off for our winter vacation uh, the 24th through the 1st, which is a Tuesday. Uh, so we'll return to school on Wednesday, January 2nd. And then we have uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, holiday on Monday the 21st, so there'll be no school that day as well. Uh, brings us into February. Uh, February vacation is the 18th through the 22nd. Um, we get into March. Again, uh, we have two early release dates scheduled for the month of March. The first, first one being March 6th, which will be, again, a professional development early release day. And I have to say, we have one coming up next week. And I know uh, the principals uh, are very thankful to that because they're, they're doing their MCAS trainings with their staffs. Uh, the security requirements that have to go over every year. Uh, but also as we transition to the online assessment, there's actually quite a bit of training for the teachers to go through. So I, I, I know the, the principals and even the staff members are very thankful to have that time. So again, we're proposing to have another day in March uh, in really already thinking ahead. We had actually already talked about this administratively. Uh, we would use that day again for uh, MCAS training next year. And then the 21st would be parent-teacher conferences for the spring after the second trimester. We then get into April. We have our April vacation, the 15th through the 19th. We then go into May, obviously we have Memorial Day off, the 27th, and then we get into June, and June 14th is our proposed last day with 180 days scheduled. As you know, uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education requires us to create a calendar that has two end dates, one with 180 days and then one with 185. So if we do have snow days and have to push back the end date, uh, it, with five snow days, we'd have the 21st as our last day. And I just want to point out too, and, and I know this comes up every year, there really is some maybe misunderstanding about that 
180 days versus 185. If, if we have more than five days, we still have to make up more than five days. So it's not, it's not parents sometimes, uh, you know, and, and I think it's just the way the, the regulations are written, uh, you know, you create a calendar 185 days and you don't have to make them up after that. And you actually have to make those days up. Um, it really where it gets tricky is we have to go into July, then that's, that's where we really then had to get creative. But right now, um, you know, we're proposing, uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, to get out June 14th with the no snow days. Uh, maybe wishful thinking, but that's, uh, that's what we're going with. Um, your second sheet really just has the calendar of important dates. So on this, on this calendar, you'll see uh, when the terms close, uh, when the midpoints are of the terms or quarters or trimesters, depending on which level we're talking about, when the open houses would be. And again, these have you know, been reviewed with, with staff. Um, you can see, obviously, the parent-teacher conferences are, are listed there as well. So I certainly won't bore you by going over each and every date on, on that sheet, but uh, you know, they are there for your review. Uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions about the calendar, and I certainly know tonight is the first review, so I'm open to questions, comments, concerns, suggestions, make any changes that uh, the committee feels necessary. Thank you, Mr. Powers. Any questions or comments? Yes, uh, Mrs. Uh, Holbrook? Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Powers, as I went over the calendar of mm -hmm. important dates, I was concerned about the quick turnaround, the two-day turnaround for the day of grades closing and reports card, report cards being issued for the elementary pre-K to four, especially since the pre-K to four report card is that standards-based <coughs> um, and a lot of analysis goes into the grade. So after calculating out the t semesters in the past three years, I found that the least amount of school days that were given to the pre-K to four teachers to prepare their report cards was six days, and the greatest amount of time was um, given was nine school days. And I'd like um, it, some reasoning, perhaps, for why um, the sure. two day. A absolutely. Well, one of the one of the thoughts was this. You know, as as we have transitioned to our new student information system, Power School, um, in, in this, you know, so Ms. Holbrook, you actually bring up a great point in terms of the elementary. Uh, you know, maybe we need to take take a step back and, and maybe section those days out. Uh, but let me explain why kind of the quick turnaround. Really, with the student information system, Power School, teachers are actually able to keep a live grade book, so their grades are constantly going in. Um, so what happens is, you know, we, we have traditionally in the past built in extra days towards the end of the semester or after the semester quarter or trimester is done where <coughs> teachers would be able to sit down and actually put their grades in. Uh, at the middle school and high school, that's happening on a, on a regular basis, daily basis, uh, where parents are getting updates um, in, in students at the high school as well. So the, the thought process, I guess, with those, with those two levels is that they really don't need that additional time because their grades would be in there. You raise the point about the elementary, and certainly because uh, presently the elementary folks aren't um, using the, the live grade book, um, that certainly may present a, a challenge to get the, the quick turnaround. I do know, speaking with, uh, with Meg, our <coughs> hope is that we're, we'd be able to possibly pilot after some training next year, uh, having a, a small portion of our elementary teachers, whether it's our lead teachers or on a voluntary basis, actually use the grade book um, at the elementary level through Power School. Um, you know, there's, there's ways that, you know, we, we'd certainly know we'd have to take baby steps with that, and it might not be a, a live grade book, say, at the middle, like it is at the middle school and high school. Uh, but our hope is we have this capability, um, and I know, you know, being an elementary person myself, very, you know, your, your pencil and paper grade book, uh, we'd really like to be able to transition to using this Power School grade book. So I, I think our thought was, um, We'll keep it consistent and have a, a quick turnaround, but you know you, the point you raise is certainly valid, and that's something that you know I can go back and, and try to re, you know revise and, and see if we can do it maybe for all or or maybe like I said just section out the, the elementary. I guess one of my other concerns is that in the elementary grades we keep a portfolio mm -hmm. to show that progression of their work, so it's not a grade book per se. Mm -hmm. So we have those standards and then within the standard there are certain expectations that need to be met. Right. So in order to do that we collect all the data and then we have to go through and analyze it all. So that two day you know turnaround is really quick mm -hmm. um, and perhaps you know a discussion with the lead teachers and um, so the, this year we have what a three day? 
So I believe it's a, a three-day turnaround. Three day no, turnaround. I'd have to, I'd have to, you know, not having the calendar in front of me. I have it right there, and for the first semester, the grades closed Thursday, November 30th, and report cards were issued on Wednesday, December 13th, which was actually nine school days. And then I can actually I, I can address that piece. So th there are really two different dates there. Yeah. Um, one is when grades close, and then one is report cards go out. What had happened in, under the old system with Redica? <coughs> um, grades would close. We gave them three days to get their grades in, yeah. and then what would happen is from there, the print, report cards would then have to be printed, put into the teacher's mailbox. The teachers would get them, review them, submit them back to the office. So that was another three to five days of that process where we don't have to go through that anymore, um, that has really cut down on the turnaround. What we did this year though, to keep it consistent in terms of the transition, we did, we did build those days in, but what we found, and certainly, you know, Ms. Watson, I'm not to put, gonna put you on the spot, but I know at the middle school, high school level, it was kind of like, what are we waiting for? Our grades are in, and even at the elementary, I, I know once the grades were in, we kind of sat and waited, said, okay, well, we've always kind of waited another five days before we put the report cards out. So our hope is that we can still use those three days to get the grades in, but then at that point, report cards go live. We don't really have to wait because we don't have to have those checks and balances anymore of, of printing them out. So you are right, there's a, a nine day gap in some situations, but it wasn't actually nine days of uh, getting your grades in. Grades would, would typically be required to be in uh, three days afterwards. And then the gap was uh, getting the report cards out. But valid one, so definitely take Thank that. You. Yeah. Any other, yes, Mr. Dillon. I just wanted to point out for the good of the cause, um, I know Good Friday, we, we usually get uh, off. Good Friday in 2019 falls on April 19th, which is April yes. vacation, yes. so it's included in there for folks if they yeah. are And that's actually why, too, um, it didn't really affect the, the end date. You know, we're always getting out around the 14th um, in, in, you know, the question came up, well, if we start later, does that mean we're gonna get out later? And the answer was no, because of Good Friday falling on vacation, it wasn't a day that we had to, to worry about. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Powers. Right, and so thank you. we'll come back for a vote at the March I'd meeting. love to come back. All right, <laughs> thank you. We we'll look forward to that. And next we have approval of changes to the 2018-2019 Bridgewater Rainham Regional High School course selection book, Miss Watson. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of school committee, Superintendent Swenson. I am excited to be here tonight to propose the changes that we would like to make to our course selection booklet for our upcoming school year for 2018-2019. I have shared these ahead of time with the superintendent, um, and I'm here tonight to review them and answer any questions that school committee members might have. Um, I will begin with mathematics. Perhaps um, it's because I taught math, perhaps it's, you know, it's my background area, but I'm most excited about it. Um, we are always looking at ways of creating new pathways for students, and I always try to look and make sure we're balancing the upper level courses with also courses where students kind of just require a little bit more support. So we would like to offer um, two new courses next year. One is a more robust, rigorous course, which will be offered to incoming ninth grade students. Um, currently, incoming ninth grade students traditionally take algebra at either the accelerated level or the academic level. What we do is when they're in eighth grade, we offer a placement test to the students that take the accelerated grade eight math. And based on test results, we would um, jump algebra one and start them in geometry. We'd like to roll that back a little and offer a different type of pathway which will also get these students to calculus by, by their senior year. So it's still gonna be a, a test-based um, placement, although we'd also, this year, are gonna be including teacher recommendation and their current grade eight um, coursework grade that the teachers are gonna provide for us. Students who are eligible would enter into this new course which we would like to offer called Algebra slash Geometry. Very creative name, I know. Um, but it's a hybrid course. And so the intent is that in ninth grade, they would take algebra slash geometry. In 10th grade, they would take geometry slash algebra two. Their junior year, they would take algebra two slash pre-calc. Then they would take calculus their senior year. Um, so it's a more robust pathway for, for them to take. 
On the flip side, we'd also like to offer for our upper, upper level students, meaning our, our um, juniors, Algebra 2. And we'd like to split it into two parts. So we want to offer an Algebra 2 Part A for certain students to take during their junior year and then offer Part B during their senior year. And that would be for students that need a little bit more support in that area. Um, so those two that I'm most excited about. Some of the other changes um, or more cosmetic, I guess, in nature. In the business department, we will be removing um, business management as a course. And the reason for that is that the curriculum's already integrated in a course that we currently teach called Marketing and Entrepreneurship. So it was a little redundant to offer both. We would like to teach <coughs> Marketing and Entrepreneurship and expand it to offer it to 10th graders as well. Currently, it's only offered to 11th and 12th graders. Um, we would like to add personal finance at the accelerated level. Currently, we only offer it at the academic level. And we are going to be removing business and communications. In the art department, we would like to offer advanced drawing and painting as well as portfolio, both at the academic level, where currently they are not offered. We would like to restrict enrollment in a course that we offer called Art and Integration to students in grades 11 and 12. Right now it's offered to students in grades 10 through 12. 10 is a little young, so we want to offer 11th and 12. Um, advanced ceramics and crafts, digital art, and digital photography will all be removed from the course selection booklet. And that's primarily due to a lack of staffing. We only have one art teacher. When a teacher can only teach five sections, it kind of limits what you, what you can offer. Um, in foreign language, we are going to remove Spanish and Latin American culture as, as well as French culture. They just haven't run in the past two or three years, so we're just going to take them out. We would like to offer um, a supportive class for incoming ninth graders called biotechnology that would not replace these students taking biology, but they would take biotechnology in ninth grade, and then in tenth grade they would take the full, the full um, biology course. And at the end of 10th grade, they would sit for the MCAS exam for biology. In history, we would like to add a course called Citizenship and Action, which is a civics course. Almost every other year, I'm up here pushing for a civics course. And it's really contingent on staffing. Um, so hopefully, if things, things work out, we will be able to offer this. It's great. I would like to, down the road, make it a graduation requirement for students at the mm. high school. But we're not there yet. So right now, we're just looking to kind of implement the course. Um, it's a semester course that would be run at the accelerated level for students in grades 11 and 12. And we would like to edit um, our current music theory course and offer it at the advanced placement level. So those are kind of the major changes. Other substantive changes, um, which also would require um, your approval, besides all names and dates obviously being updated, um, level recommendations will continue to appear on second term <coughs> report cards. These will, will be based on grade requirements as well as teacher recommendations. Um, level changes will only be permitted on a case-by-case -case basis based upon the established criteria. They will only occur at the end of first term marking period, which is what happens now. No level changes will be permitted after first term. Currently, again, what is happening. In order to remain at the accelerated level, students must have a final grade of 80% or better or have their teacher's recommendation. So if a student has a 75, but the teacher says yes, they should remain in accelerated, then they remain in accelerated. In order for a student to move from the academic level up to the accelerated level, we are looking to mandate a final average of 90% or better in the previous year's class, as well as have the teacher's recommendation. And we would like to continue to offer, um, in the math department, students who take the accelerated algebra one during their freshman year and perform very well in it that the following year they can double up and they could take accelerated geometry and accelerated two. Mm. So that's a nice mm. pathway to keep because a student <clears throat> might not necessarily make the cut for the, for the new algebra geometry class. So they might start in algebra one accelerated, but they also might have ambitions of taking calculus by senior year. So this offers them a way to get there. Sophomore year, we double them up. We do have a few students who do take advantage of that as well. So those are the major changes. Thank you, Ms. Watson. So we're looking for a motion to approve the changes to the 2018-2019 course selection book for our regional high school as outlined by Ms. Watson. Sure. And that comes with your recommendation as well, Mr. Swinson? It, it does, Madam Chair. I just had one question. Sure. I don't know if the committee wanted I to ask too. a question prior, but you um, go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Well, I was just curious if this, uh, these changes are 
going to be reflective of Mr. Swenson's initial budget? One position, the history position. So it's always kind of a sticky situation <laughs> yes. that we come and we do course selection proposals in February before the budget's actually approved. So everything that is proposed, if approved, would just be approved to go into the book. It doesn't necessarily mean that we can or that we will run it. Mm. So sometimes um, you folks are very gracious. You approve all of the courses that we ever ask for. It's great. We put them into the book. Sometimes they don't run. Either the students don't sign up for them or we just don't have the, the ability to, to run the course. So. It, and we do have a disclaimer in the book that says just because these, these courses are listed, it does not necessarily mean that they will or can run okay. on any given year. Thank you. And I think I neglected putting a motion on the floor first. Mr. Dolan tried to make that motion, and Mrs. Holbrook seconded that. And now discussion. And yes, Mrs. Clip Harris. I have a couple questions. On the mathematics, <coughs> also pro mathematics, will they still have that honest geometry? For those people that tested into it like they used to? No, so this replacing it with this algebra geometry. This is gonna replace it. And the reason why we want to do that is because we, we know that when the students in the accelerated grade eight math class um, leave grade eight, it's technically about three quarters of the high school curriculum. Mm -hmm. So they lose a whole quarter of the curriculum that never technically gets taught to these students. For the most part, they're very good math students and they kind of catch up with it, yeah. but there's a little gap. This will ensure that we can kind of take one step back finish that quarter, and then start the geometry, which will just give them a more solid foundation. And algebra truly is that solid foundation that you need before you can take any other upper level math class. And then my other question was, the, uh, I'm all for the personal finance and the citizens in action class. How do you determine what the requirements are for accelerating for that for a student that's maybe not coming, where it doesn't have a prerequisite type class, mm -hmm. who would determine if they could, would be eligible for accelerating or not? They usually do. That's a very good question. When there isn't a prereq class that the teacher can put down a recommendation, we usually leave it up to the students to, to choose the level. And for the first two weeks of school, it's kind of fluid. They, they can switch levels. So we teach a lot of hybrid courses at the high school. So I might be in a course with you, and it might be, say, a criminal law course, which is offered at the accelerated and academic level at the same time. They, the teacher just differentiates the assessments. Um, you might take it at accelerated and I might take it at academic and maybe a week into this I think, hey, I can, I can challenge myself. I want to take it at the accelerated level now that I understand what will be required of me. They go down to guidance and they can change the level. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Dolan. Uh, under business, business communications being removed, what was the, the thought process behind removing business, that? Um, business communications was actually a, a favor class that, that we had. We have a wonderful foreign language teacher who actually came to us from the business world, more of the communications field. And our business department, um, it's only four or five people. Our kids love to take business classes. You can only offer so many. We were able to manipulate that year because the incoming freshman for, for foreign language was a smaller cohort. So we were able to kind of increase a few class sizes and free her up to teach a section. So we thought, hey, want to teach this? And, and it was great, but we don't really, we don't really need that, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Just wanna, the, the, the biotech for, um, is that more of a, is, is it for credit? It is for credit. It's for credit, okay. Mm -hmm. But it is for, it's a preparatory It's a little class. bit of a preparatory. It's going to be um, probably more of like a, of a C grid type, type special ed class for okay. a hand select student. Students cannot sign up for biotechnology. It will be something that we will decide through the team process, through teacher recommendations from eighth grade up. And it's to give those students kind of a nice <coughs> solid foundation first. Then they sit for the, for the regular biology class during sophomore year. And then they will take the bio MCAS their sophomore year. So is that, a, it, it's going to be identical, in their schedule, it will be their science class? Mm -hmm. Okay. It will count, it counts as a core science. Okay. It will be their ninth grade science. Then in, in 10th grade, they would take biology. And then in 11th grade, it can open up for them. They, they can take earth science. They could take chemistry, okay. marine bio. They take a whole Thank slew you. of great classes. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Any other questions? Okay, we have a motion and a second on the floor. And I see no further discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Thank, Thank you. you, Ms. Watson. Thank you, Ms. Watson. And next, we have approval of gifts and grants. Mr. Swenson. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. As always, I, <clears throat> I will read all the gifts and grants and then ask for a vote of consensus from the school committee for <laughs> approval. Uh, the Conan Community Health Center had contacted our nurse leader, Ms. Marie Fahey, 
um, earlier in uh, the month and to gauge how they could assist the district in the recent flu outbreak. Um, Mrs. Fahey then contacted our director of facilities, Mr. Paul Fox, and said that the purchasing of disinfectant sprayers uh, was quite costly, uh, $2,240.50. The Conan uh, Center immediately sent a check to Mr. Fox uh, to pay for that amount in full. So that's one of the first ones, very generous from the uh, Conant uh, Community Health Center here in Bridgewater. And then Exxon Mobil, as part of the Mobile Educational Alliance program, has granted $500 to the Rainham Middle School. Exxon Mobil, again, uh, as part of the same program, has also granted two checks of $500 each to the Williams Intermediate School, totaling $1,000. And finally, a very generous uh, donation for the, by the Genspa Group, which is the parents organization at the George Mitchell Elementary School, purchased a playground fence for the Mitchell at the Middle at a cost of $6,950. So with that, I ask for approval of these very generous gifts. We have a motion to approve. Motion by Dr. Prumendowski. Second. Second by Mr. Gelfi. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So voted. Next, we have approval of warrants. And first, we have the payroll warrants dated January 4th, January 18th, February 1st, and February 15th, 2018. Do we have a motion to approve? Madam Chair? Yes, uh, Mr. I need to recuse myself as my wife works for the district. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dolan. Yeah, and Madam Chair, I need to recuse myself as it benefits my, myself financially. Thank you, Mrs. Holbrook. And we have a motion to approve. Motion by Mr. Gelfi, second by uh, Mr. Marrera. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? And that is a vote of one, two, three, four, five. I'm sorry, six in favor and two abstentions. Thank you. And next we have a general warrants dated January 4th, January 18th. February 1st and February 15th, 2018. Motion to approve by Dr. Pirandowski, second by Mr. Marrera. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Unanimous vote, thank you very much. And that brings us to announcements. We have a notice of public hearing in compliance with Chapter 30A, Section 20, and Chapter 71, Section 38N of the Massachusetts General Laws you, general public, are hereby notified that a public hearing on the preliminary fiscal year 2019 budget of the Bridgewater Rainham Regional School District School Committee will be held on Wednesday, March 7th, that is next Wednesday, it 2018, is. at 7 p.m. right here in the lecture hall of the Bridgewater Rainham Regional High School. At that time, all interested individuals will be given an opportunity to be heard for or against the whole or any part of the proposed budget. We'll have a complete budget presentation by our budget subcommittee, and we invite everyone to come and join us for that. Also, MSBA on March 5th is going to receive the appro approval of the um, review and hopefully approve the OPM selection for the George H. Mitchell Building Project. Mr. <coughs> Swenson, you will be attending that. I will, along with Mrs. Macedo, Mr. Fox, and possibly Mr. Dutton from the town manager of Bridgewater. Thank you. And the school committee administration and community members are invited to attend the Bridgewater State of the Town Address on Tuesday, March 13th at the Academy Building. We actually have a nice invitation. It says, in accordance with Section 2-3 of the Bridgewater Home Rule Charter, the Honorable Timothy Fitzgibbons and Town Manager Mr. Michael Dutton request your presence at the State of the Town Address. address. Tuesday, March 13th at 6.30 p.m., Academy Building Council Chambers, 66 Central Square in Bridgewater. Town, town Council meeting will follow at 7.30 p.m. Across our district and across the nation, right across America, week is being celebrated in our Bridgewater and Rainham schools as well. And we thank all of those that are participating in that, including some of those sitting at the table here. Um, and so we thank you all for that. Any other announcements from any committee members? I have one more to make. Um, 
April, the last Saturday in April is our annual town elections in our towns of Bridgewater and Rainium. Very important elections as always. We have four members of our current committee, or four seats on our committee, I should say, that are up for election, two from Rainium and two from Bridgewater. March 8th is the deadline for taking out nomination papers. March 12th is the deadline for returning them. And I just want to quickly announce, and then we'll have more to say about this at the April meeting, but um, I have made a very difficult decision that I will um, not be seeking re-election to the school committee at this time. Um, I have had the honor of serving on this committee, particularly honor as a former um, uh, graduate of our high school and I think one of probably one of the first high school BR graduates to serve on this committee mm -hmm. and for the last seven years particularly as chairman of this committee and I thank the members of this committee and the former committees that I've served for um, reason it's such a difficult decision is because we have such a great district and as I said, it's been such an honor to serve. We have such a great administrative team, such great teachers, and, um, and everybody involved, great parents, and community support is probably unparalleled anywhere. In Bridgewater and Rainham, our communities really care about our schools and about our children. And I can certainly tell you that I will not be going privately in Rainham, of course, and will continue being involved in our RAVE organization, which predated my involvement with our school committee. This is my 21st year with RAVE, and Shoshana Gosh had started it back in 1981, and when she turned the reins over to me in 1997, I think she um, hypnotized me that you will forever be RAVE, so I will forever be RAVE. <laughs> and also continue um, with our community access, our radio channel, doing a particular VR connection, which I co-host with our superintendent, and we will continue to do that. Ms. Watson was our last Yes, you did an awesome job. So um, I have more to say the April meeting. I just wanted to bring that out so that people do know that if anyone is interested in seeking an uh, elective office for the Bridgewater Union School Committee, the deadline for taking out nomination papers is March 8th. And the deadline for returning them is March 8th. And with that, I'll uh, ask for a motion to adjourn tonight's meeting. Motion by Mr. Morera, second by Mr. Galford. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And opposed for the adjournment. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.